Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. We've got a free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. It's a great study guide. Absolutely uh, doesn't cost you a thing except for an email. Uh, so definitely go take advantage of that at reallifepharmacology.com. All right, the drug of the day today is alfuzosin. Brand name of this medication is Uroxetrol. And this medication is an alpha-1 blocker. And if you remember uh, from previous episode quite a while ago, uh, I did cover tamsulosin. Uh, and I have covered, I believe, a couple of the uh, non-selective alpha blockers as well. So alfuzosin tends to be more on the selective side uh, when it comes to alpha blockers. So uh, basically what that means from a clinical practice standpoint, um, we're going to be selective for the bladder tissue more so than the blood vessels. So non-selective uh, alpha blockers affect the vessels and bladder tissue, and that can lead to significant um, risk for dizziness and hypotension. Now, it can happen with the selective agents as well, um, but the risk is generally uh, considered less with a medication like alfuzosin. So this medication is used for BPH. That is absolutely the primary use that I've seen it used in practice. Um, there is an off-label use uh, to potentially help with stones that are in the ureter and to help pass those stones out through the urine. Basically, it kind of opens up the passageways um, to maybe help uh, relieve some of that pressure and pain associated with that, that passage. So those are the two uh, uses that I've seen this medication used for. Uh, it comes uh, as an extended release tablet, 10 milligrams once a day. Uh, and again, how that, that drug works mechanistically, it's an alpha-1 antagonist or blocker, uh, and it works in the lower urinary tract and essentially blocks sympathetic action. And if you remember, that sympathetic action on those alpha, alpha receptors causes smooth muscle contraction, um, which ultimately can increase symptoms of urinary retention, which is very, very common uh, with BPH. So um, that drug causes that uh, bladder neck and the prostate to relax, and this helps ease uh, the passage of urine uh, through the ureter and so on and so forth. So um, basically, uh, what you end up having with this medication or the, the goal of the medication is to improve urine outflow. Uh, dosing, I, I alluded to 10 milligrams once a day. That doesn't really change uh, at all. Um, there is a caution with creatinine clearance, less than 30 mils per minute. Um, also, patients with moderate to severe hepatic impairment, uh, this drug should be avoided in that situation. All right, let's talk adverse drug reactions a little bit. So uh, I alluded to um, alpha blockers causing low blood pressure. Hopefully, alpha is a little bit less than some of the other uh, non-selective agents like prazosin or uh, terazosin, for example. Um, but that is a possibility. So dizziness, uh, syncope, and this is most likely to occur when the patient first starts the medication uh, and obviously within the you know first few hours, for example, of, of taking their medication. Uh, so pay attention to that. Uh, fatigue has been reported with this medication, CNS depressant type um, adverse effects. Not crazy common, um, but it has been reported. Uh, and then some really, really rare things, which I've definitely seen uh, one or two of these uh, come up on board exams, so definitely uh, pay attention here. Uh, so one is the risk for floppy iris syndrome. Now there is more data with tamsulosin in that it can contribute to this, but basically any patient undergoing uh, cataract surgery and specific procedures associated with that cataract surgery, um, it can increase the risk of this eye condition. Uh, so definitely important to get on the same page 
um, with the eye specialist that a patient may be working with and uh, help them recognize that, hey, they, they are on this medication or at least relay that information to the patient uh, to remind um, their eye specialist to look at the medication list and ask them uh, what they're taking because um, this one can uh, is associated with some potential issues there. Again, not crazy common, um, but something definitely an, an eye, eye doctor is going to want to be aware of there. Uh, so priapism is another kind of rare adverse effect. Um, so if patients uh, have an erection for greater than four hours, um, definitely should be seeking uh, medical attention in that situation. Uh, one other rare thing that has been been reported, I haven't seen it personally clinically, uh, it may worsen angina, chest pain uh, type symptoms. So um, maybe something to uh, look out for there. Uh, kinetics. So food actually increases absorption. So generally, uh, this medication is recommended to give right after a meal. Um, it's dosed once daily. It's extended release. Um, so the kinetics-wise, it's going to cover that patient um, all throughout most of the day there. And then obviously with repeated use, um, that, that helps with that as well. Uh, it does have some CYP3A4 deactivation. So as you can imagine, when we get to drug interactions, um, that is going to be a potential concern. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor, and then we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for any pharmacist board certification study material, like BCPS, ambulatory care, geriatrics, BCM, TMS, NAPLEX, go check out meded101.com slash store. We've got a growing list of resources there. We update the content annually uh, and now have helped thousands of pharmacists uh, prepare and, and pass for their board exam. Uh, so go support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. If you're another healthcare professional, nurse practitioner, PA, nurse, med student, dietitian, we've got tons of books on medications and how they uh, interact and case studies and all that sort of stuff. So uh, drug interactions, food medication interactions, case studies, uh, clinical pearls, lots of different books uh, to help you better prepare yourself for managing medications uh, and or assessing uh, patients out in the real world when it comes to their medications. So again, all those links you can find at meded101.com slash store. All right, let's wrap up with drug interactions. And there are definitely a few that I think of uh, with alpha zosin and some of these uh, alpha blocking agents. So first and foremost, I alluded to the fact um, that this drug is significantly broken down by CYP3A4. And because of that, CYP3A4 inhibitors, uh, some of the azole antifungals, um, some antibiotics, uh, such as clarithromycin, erythromycin, uh, grapefruit juice is another example. These can all increase concentrations of alpha zosin. So really, really important to um, remember those CYP3A4 drug, drug interactions. And on the flip side, if you've got a CYP3A4 uh, inducer, carbamazepine, for example, rifampin, uh, those can actually lower concentrations of this medication and increase the risk of a patient not responding to it. Uh, next drug interaction I want to point out is probably a pretty obvious one, um, the blood pressure lowering effect. So any patient um, who's got lower blood pressure to begin with or taking antihypertensives, uh, that's definitely a situation where we want to pay attention to. And I want to specifically mention um, the PDE5 inhibitors. I have seen a couple of cases uh, where this has been a significant issue and the combination of alpha uh with a PDE5 inhibitor. So a reminder, that's like sildenafil, tadalafil, uh, those type of, of medications for erectile dysfunction. That combination can profoundly drop blood pressure. So that is very, very important uh, to pay attention to. Uh, other things to, to think about, um, QTC prolongation, you will see that pop up on interactions, checkers, and things. Um, not something I'm generally crazy worried about, um, unless I've got a patient on a bunch of other medications, you know, amiodarone, antipsychotics, uh, some antibiotics have some QT prolongation risk. So, 
that's more of a cumulative type of thing or for patients at great risk uh, is where I would, you know, maybe have a little bit more concern uh, for alfuzosin. And then last, I wanted to mention drugs that can basically oppose the beneficial effects of this medication. So if you think about drugs that may have opposing effects, you know, my mind goes to drugs with alpha agonist activity. So a good example of that uh, would be pseudoephedrine. So that's a medication commonly used as a decongestant, uh, but it has alpha agonist action, which would directly oppose our alpha blocking action. So uh, a drug like pseudoephedrine could definitely worsen symptoms of BPH. The other uh, kind of class or general mechanism uh, that may worsen uh, BPH and worsen um, the uh, outcomes, uh, obviously, with alfazosin or make it not as effective, uh, are anticholinergic medif- medications. So uh, diphenhydramine, for example, a common over-the-counter medication that's found in many, many sleep aids. This drug can actually cause urinary retention or worsen urinary retention and potentially blunt the beneficial effects of a drug like alpha alfazosin. So uh, definitely important to remember some of those medications when we're dealing with that. And in addition to that, the prescribing cascade is so important to watch for. I've seen it so many times where a patient starts an anticholinergic drug, let's say amitriptyline for you know pain or depression or something like that. That drug is started and then one week, two weeks, three weeks later, all of a sudden patients reporting issues with not being able to go to the bathroom as well as they could. Um, So maybe they kind of had an underlying BPH situation and maybe that anticholinergic drug kind of put them over the top. And now maybe a provider not recognizing that adverse effect from the anticholinergic medication. Now they're diagnosed with BPH and now we're adding a drug like alfazosin. So really pay attention to that prescribing cascade. It's so important in helping to reduce polypharmacy in our patients. All right, well, that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. I hope you found it beneficial, learned some clinical practice pearls uh, that you can share with any of your colleagues, friends, uh, and other healthcare professionals. If you found this podcast beneficial, please do me a huge favor, leave a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, and support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Your support there goes directly to help support this podcast. I'm greatly appreciative uh, to those of you who have um, done that already. Uh, If you want to track me down, Eric Christensen, uh, PharmD, BCPS, BCGP, you can do that on LinkedIn. Uh, Alternatively, feel free to shoot me an email, mededucation101 at gmail.com with any suggestions, comments, uh, or anything like that that you might have. With that, I'm going to sign off for today. I thank you so much for listening, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.